Sycamore, Indian Hill, Madeira, Ursuline, uh, Fairview German, and Clark Montessori. And I am the lead therapist at Indian Hill High School. Um, we have a couple of folks here uh, from our district that work in um, two of the buildings. We have Kelsey McKinney here, who is our therapist at Sycamore Junior High. And then we have Mary Hill, who is our therapist at Blue Ash Elementary. Our topic tonight is how to support your children during uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about each age group. Uh, so we'll talk about some behaviors that you may see from each of the age groups and some best practices for supporting children in those age groups. Uh, and then we will end with um, some signs that you may need to seek uh, further care for your child. I will ask if you have any questions along the way, you can feel free to put those in the chat. Lisa Zelvi is here with us and she um, has volunteered to keep an eye on the chat. And so at the end of our, our time, we will kind of field those questions. And so if you have questions along the way, just kind of drop them in the chat and Lisa will keep an eye on that um, as we kind of go along. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Mary, I'm gonna unmute you, who's your first? There you are, okay. And then I'm gonna share my screen. And okay, we've got more people in the waiting room. So let me get them in here before we start. Okay, Mary, you're up first. So go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I will be covering the um, primary elementary school aged portion of the presentation on how you can support uh, your child's emotional needs during this time. Um, so I, I think we can all pretty much agree that this, whether or not, you know, we're afraid of contracting the disease or if somebody we know has contracted the disease, um, this is impacting everybody um, in a lot of ways. Um, and this type of stress or prolonged stress, especially the type that involves the possible threat of physical or um, psychological harm to oneself or a loved one uh, can definitely impact a child's ability to manage and function. Um, so most children will be able to manage with the support of loved ones. Um, for some, when there's that prolonged stress or trauma, there can be an increased risk of stress-related physical and mental illness. Uh, and some of the risk factors for this can include um, a pre-existing mental health problem, prior traumatic experiences, family instability, or uh, loss of a loved one. So some signs that your child might be struggling. Uh, regressive behaviors such as um, bedwetting after being toilet trained or thumb sucking. Um, an increase in conflict and power struggles at home. Uh, reluctance to separate from you. Um, increase in moodiness or irritability. Increase in tantrums, meltdowns, or trouble sleeping. So these are all gonna be things that um, you'll be seeing an increase in or things that are, are new for your child. Um, so the brain states model <clears throat> identifies three internal states um, and the behaviors that these states are likely to produce. And so by understanding and being aware of these three states, we can respond in a conscious manner to what is happening to us in the moment. And these three states are survival. So this is the am I safe, fight, flight, freeze state. Um, the emotional state, which asks the question, am I loved? And then the executive state, which asks the question, what can I learn? And this is where um, we are most um, able to problem solve. Okay. So the survival state, when, it, when, when anybody's brain is in the survival state, the primal brain is taking over. So 
um, this is where um, for our children, they're going to be asking the question, am I safe? The safe safety is the number one concern here. So what you might see are uh, tantrums, physical aggression, again, more of those regressive behaviors. And the most important thing you can do for um, a child who is in the survival state is to create a sense of safety. Um, practice deep breathing with your child and provide reassurance, saying something like, um, you're safe, keep breathing, you're going to be okay, you know, we can get through this together. Um, I actually just had an experience with my son who is in the survival state because he uh, had a, an allergic reaction about a half an hour ago. And so um, I had to really check myself and make sure that I was um, remaining calm and reassuring him that he's going to be okay. We're going to give you some Benadryl and you're, you know, and, and everything's going to be fine. So, um, so I think being aware of how, of the state that we are in as well, so that we can better handle the state that our, that our child is in. Um, so the emotional state, this looks like um, controlling behavior, um, short-tempered, argumentative, or, or sassy, um, you know, kids refusing to, um, you know, clear their plate after dinner, or refusing to go to bed, or um, not wanting to, you know, do their homework. Um, and for this state is really um, sort of a mid-level functioning state, um, and this is where kids need connection um, and kids are going to seek that connection with you or another trusted adult in any way that they can that could be positive or negative so um, what we really want to do for our kids at this point is connect with them in meaningful ways so playing with them soothing touch um, using open-ended questions such as um, tell me one good thing about your day today or tell me um, one thing that was tough for you today, um, instead of just saying, how was your day? Because then they're going to say, good. Um, and also helping um, some of our younger kids identify their feelings. Um, and, you know, so having a feelings chart or using a feelings thermometer to help them identify what they're feeling and how intense that feeling is can be helpful. And then finally, the executive state. Um, and this is the state that has, it represents the optimal functioning. And this is where we can learn, problem solve. Um, what it looks like in kids is um, maybe being more helpful at home. They're having regular sleeping and eating patterns, displaying those expected behaviors. Um, and, and what we can do in this moment as parents is to really take this time to teach and practice using healthy coping skills, um, such as conflict resolution skills, social skills, mindfulness. Um, kids that are in that survival state or emotional state are not in a state to learn or practice, um, or sorry, to learn any new skills. And so that's why it's really important in the executive state to, to be practicing these these skills. Um, the most important thing we can do as parents is to model calm. If um, our child sees us in an anxious state, then they're naturally going to be anxious. Mom or dad or um, you know whoever is the caretaker is responsible for keeping me safe. And if they're feeling anxious, then um, then that must mean that you know that. I might not be safe. So I think we really have to reflect and ask ourselves, what are we communicating to our kids, whether it's through language or, or you know, body behavior? Um, how am I feeling right now? Recognizing, again, the state that, um, the, the state that we are in um, and so that we can handle those moments as effectively as possible. Um, relying on some sort of routine. I know these, uh, this time is, um, everybody's just kind of doing the best that they can. Um, but having some sort of a routine um, can be really helpful for kids and really helps kids um, to, you know, that, that safety and structure. Um, again, asking open-ended specific questions. So, um, you know, not, not leaving it so that they can have a one word answer such as good or fine. Um, and, helping them identify their feelings, having laid back discussions during family time, whether that's 
at uh, dinner time or during a family walk. You don't want to do these during bedtime because this can, you know, if, if you trigger any anxious feelings, they're going to have a hard time sleeping. Um, but um, one idea for incorporating these laid back discussions is a game called the rose. And um, there's three parts to the game um, as there are three parts to a rose. So the petal is, tell me something that you liked about your day to day. Uh, the thorn is, tell me something that you didn't like about your day to day or something that was tough today. And then the bud is, tell me something that you are looking forward to in the future. Uh, I think this can kind of help um, spur some conversation with your kids. And what can you say to your kids? Um, so in this example, when can I see my friends again? Um, it's important to reflect and validate how they're feeling. You know, I know it's really hard that you can't see your friends right now. Um, and answer honestly, we, we don't know when we will be able to see our friends again or when we're gonna be able to get back to some sort of sense of normalcy. Um, but you know, we have to stay home so that we can keep other people safe. Um, inviting other questions in case, you know, that there's um, other questions that they have about what's going on right now. Um, and then reassuring them about, um, you know, we are going to be able to see our friends again. And, you know, life will return to, um, you know, what we consider normal again, um, but it's just gonna take time. So how can we help you feel more connected to your friends if this is something that um, you're having a hard time with? Uh, and then just a, a list of ideas to keep kids connected. I think the most important thing that we can do right now, um, everybody, kids, adults, everybody, is to stay connected to others, whether that's, um, you know, through FaceTime, Zoom, you know, video chats. Um, some other examples in here are, you know, having your child pick out a recipe and then you cook that meal together. Um, coloring, go for a walk. Um, but again, just making sure that you're staying connected to each other and those that we aren't able to, to see right now, but um, we are lucky in this day and age to be able to have that capability to have these um, video chats with others. And I know for, you know, me, myself, I've actually been more connected to people that are, you know, family members and friends that live, you know, long distance away because everybody's stuck at home. And, um, you know, we actually have a chance to be more connected with some of those people during this time. And then as a closing note to my portion, just to remember that all behavior is a form of communication. So every behavior that your child exhibits is them trying to tell you something. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I will transition over to Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey's gonna talk about how to support our middle school kiddos. Okay, so, um, for, for junior high and green school intermediate kids, um, you know, we're really seeing a very wide range of kind of developmental level um, as far as that skill set. So in early adolescence, we're definitely seeing a lot of kids that are um, starting to mature and starting to kind of, you know, start to want to be with their friends more, things like that. Um, but we, I want you guys to keep in mind kind of as we're talking about this, that if you have a child who's kind of, you know, in that 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 age range, we're seeing kind of a wide variety of um, needs. So even though I'm, I'm talking about, you know, early adolescence, keep in mind that some of these, these kiddos, even in that age, age range, might be needing things um, at kind of a, a younger age, especially kiddos who have ADHD or any other kind of mental health or developmental needs, they may be functioning a little bit lower. So, um, and that's okay. They just have different needs and, you know, you can kind of, you know, try to decide which area your child might fall into. But um, so for our early adolescent kids, we want to talk a little bit about kind of how they, um, what, what are they needing in order to develop into healthy adults? So 
um, in this stage of development, they're really needing to connect with others. Um, they really need to learn how to assert themselves. Um, they need to learn some independence away from parents. Um, they need to find their purpose and they also need to learn how to define their values. So, you know, I, as we get talking about this, I think, um, you know, with the COVID crisis and everything, we're gonna find a lot of our child's needs are unfortunately not being met developmentally because of, um, you know, the social distancing practices and things like that. So, um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and how it can affect your child. Okay, so same question. So how are we gonna help our kiddos meet their developmental needs while maintaining safe social distancing practices and health practices? Um, so we're definitely wanna get on their level. So that's kind of what I was talking about as far as you know their developmental level. So knowing that if your child has ADHD or any other number of cognitive deficits um, or mental health issues, they may be functioning a couple years younger than their chronological chronological age. So, um, you know, we're, we can set up some different things to kind of help them meet those needs. So if, if your child is in that age range where they are needing um, to learn how to connect with others, um, we want to kind of teach them to be creative in this situation as we kind of all have had to do. Um, Zoom, Zoom lunches with friends, um, that's a really great one. Netflix parties are super fun. Um, making TikToks with them. Like I tried to get my 17 year old niece to help me do this. And she was like, you're old, like you don't need to be doing this. But I mean, some kids would totally welcome that. Um, <laughs> so baking, getting outside, I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to um, encourage your children to get outside um, as well as yourself. I mean, we've got to take care of ourselves in this situation. Getting outside is something that every age range can do as long as they're healthy um you know and there's no other reason not to um getting outside i think can be really helpful getting that vitamin d and makes a lot of a difference for a lot of kids um i've even had a lot of my kiddos in therapy telling me that they are going on socially distanced walks with other kids in their neighborhood um i think that's a great idea like just reminding your child though like this is not a time to be giving hugs, like definitely not giving kisses, not like shaking hands. We don't want to be doing any of that. Um, recreate a Starbucks drink. That's super fun. Um, let them pick what's for dinner and make it together, read next to each other. So I think this is one of those things too, where you're going to see, you know, your, your, your child who is in early adolescence may or may not kind of be wanting to separate from you more. Um, so a lot of these things are like, let's do this together. So I think just keep in mind that at this age range, your child may or may not be kind of ready to like no longer be hanging out with mom and dad all the time, which is really frustrating right now. Um, so I just encourage you to kind of, again, meet them where they are. Are they, does it feel like they need, um, does it feel like they need a little bit more um, time with you? Um, do they complain about like, you're always on Zoom meetings, mom, like, why aren't you hanging out with me? Um, listen to that. Or if they're complaining about, you know, I really miss my friends, listen to that. Help them get in touch with their friends if that's something that's really bugging them. Um, you know, if they're telling you like, hey mom, the Zoom meeting thing doesn't really work for me, like these Zoom lunches, like, it just doesn't seem as, you know, nice to be with somebody that way. Um, see if you guys can, you know, do a social distance walk um, with a friend or something like that. I think, you know, these are all good things to kind of keep in mind um, activities to do. Um, so supporting your children emotionally. So this is super important. Um, I think from most of the kids that I speak with, um, that I see for therapy, you know, they're, doing pretty well emotionally, but I've heard this kind of consistent thing from all of our kids of like, it actually was kind of cool, like in the beginning that we had to stay home, you know, like, it kind of was like, oh, cool, I have an excuse to watch Netflix all day and that sort of thing. Um, but I think as this kind of has pushed on further, um, it's getting really, really tough, you know, it's getting tough. So um, validating their feelings is super important. This is something that we all are going through together. Um, it's affecting some people in different ways. Um, it's definitely causing, you know, lots of different feelings to happen um, because of a variety of different issues that might be going on as far as, you know, I know there's unemployment issues. I know there's um, 
you know, issues with getting groceries for some families. I know there's lots of different things that could be affecting a family. Even if all of that is not happening, even if there's not outside stressors really, this is still weird. Um, you know, I don't know how else to put it. This is a weird situation and, um, you know, we kind of all have to stick together and I think we can all, you know, validate our child's feelings and say, yep, this sucks. This is not fun. Um, so avoid perseveration, leaving perfectionism at the door and setting time limits. This is hard for so many of us. Um, this, you know, again, let's not be too hard on ourselves. Let's not be too hard on our kids right now. Um, you know, they still need to have rules. They still need to have consequences. They still need to have expectations. That's what we do to keep our kids healthy and functioning at an appropriate level. But we also want to remind ourselves, like, if, if my son's having a temper tantrum and he's 13 years old, like, and that has never happened before, like, let's think about the fact that we've been stuck in the house for a month, you know? Um, set a good example for your kids. Do what, practice what you preach. Um, I know that's hard sometimes. Um, take breaks, um, take multiple breaks a day, um, you know, and, and figure out a way to do that in a safe way. Um, talking about times um, that they've faced challenges, building resiliency, you know, remember that one time that you were sick for a week and you had to stay in bed for a whole week and you didn't even get to leave your room, like that was hard. Um, you know, remind them like you did great with that. Um, practicing mindfulness in any form, a really great activity that lots of um, uh, early adolescents would do really well with is encouraging them to, you know, sit for a moment and think about their five senses and what they're feeling and experiencing in each of those five senses. That's a way to kind of practice mindfulness. It's um, kind of interactive. Um, laugh at ourselves. That's a great one. Um, verbalize our feelings and how we're coping. Um, this one says, I'm overwhelmed with work, so I'm going to take a quick walk. Um, set, set a goal. Um, goals are great. Goals are great to work toward. Um, even if it's like, hey, we haven't been drinking a lot of water at home. Let's set a goal of drinking eight glasses of water a day. That's great. Um, you know, and again, you can show like resiliency in that, you know, hey, mom didn't um, drink all eight glasses yesterday. I'm going to try again tomorrow. You know, not giving up on that one. Um, remind them that feelings don't last forever. That's super important. A lot of kids get stuck in a feeling and they're like, this is never going to be better. And it's, you know, it will be better. You know, um, we're going to get through this. Everybody's going to get through this together. Um, be flexible. Again, that goes along with avoiding perseveration and avoiding perfectionism. Again, giving grace, being compassionate, breathe. None of us breathe enough. I can tell you that right now. Um, if you even take, you know, 10 minutes in the morning to sit and just take some big deep breaths, um, you know, that is really, really helpful and your child can join in that with you. Um, the setting limits is still important. Monitor their phone, check in on their chats and how they're feeling, encourage kindness. You know, this is um, something that I think, especially at this age, we really want to be giving our kids a little bit more independence and especially with their phones. However, kids get themselves in trouble <laughs> by having too much independence on phones. Um, so I do encourage you to kind of, um, you know, check in on that every now and again. Um, definitely check in on how much they're using their phone. I know it's really hard, especially right now. And, you know, sometimes mom has to be on a meeting. So you get your, your phone longer than you maybe would have so that we can get that done too. But, um, you know, just encourage limits on that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of research out there that suggests that, um, you know, phones, tablets, technology, um, th screens in general cause, a, um, cause the pleasure centers of our brain to fire up, which is why when you take away a child's um, tablet or phone or Xbox or whatever, you're seeing a monster sometimes um, as you would with a drug addict. So um, just be, be wary of that. Um, I know, again, it's a time when, when we're all using them probably a lot more than we would like. And again, definitely be, um, you know, give yourself some grace with that. But just to keep that in mind, you know, we don't want all of this to go away and then we've got a phone problem. Um, discourage passive scrolling through feeds. It does encourage FOMO major. If you guys don't know what FOMO is, it is fear of missing out um, and insecurity. So there's lots of research on FOMO as well. Um, social media encourages that. Um, our kids are getting on there every day and saying, well, so-and-so is doing this. Well, so-and-so was allowed to see their friend. Why am I not? 
um, so-and-so was allowed to hug their friend. I saw them hugging their friend. Why am I not allowed? You know, this is, it just encourages a really negative pattern. Um, again, getting outside, great idea. Um, I've, I've encouraged a lot of my families to almost make a schedule and incorporate that into the schedule. Um, so uh, another thing I'm talking a lot with families about is control. Um, this is a situation that we do not have a lot of control over. Um, and so we have to remind our children, you know, we can only control what we can do. So we can turn off the news. We can, you know, try to change our attitude, think more positive thoughts, practice gratitude. We can follow the CDC's recommendations. We can limit our social media. Again, these are things we can do. So let's let go of the things that we cannot control. So toilet paper has come back in um, abundance, I've seen, at least if my stores around me, so we're okay with that. But we can't control that. You know, we may have to be um, a little bit um, more creative with that one. Um, if others follow social distance, yes, again, you know, if, if we're having FOMO, we need to let that one go because we can't control that. Um, predicting what will happen, you know, again, mom, how long is this going to last? I don't know. Um, I wish I knew, you know, but at this time, we kind of have to just play it by ear. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen. Um, other people's motives, um, how others will react, how long this will last, the amount of, yeah, so. Um, these are things we can let go of. You're good. <laughs> um, things we can do for our own mental health. Again, um, you know, as we're all kind of um, dealing with this and coping with this, I think it's so, so important to take care of yourself. None of us are as, be as good as it, at it as we need to be, I think. It's, it's so hard. Um, so sticking to a routine can be really helpful. Um, knowing what to expect is something that kids thrive off of. We thrive off of it too. We are no different in that respect. Um, dress for the social life you want, not that you have. Um, some days, moms, it feels really, really good to put on some makeup and, you know, put, a, put an outfit on that makes you feel good. You know, that is really helpful, guys. Dads, you too. Um, that can feel really good. Get out at least once a day. Find time to move each day. Reach out to others each day. These are things that can be really helpful and, um, you know, maintaining your friendships you know th this is a time when i think it's like well I, I when you don't see them every day especially people you work with um when you don't see them every day you don't think to reach out you know let's let's kind of think about the people that we that we miss from work and let's reach out to them um stay hydrated eat well make a self-care toolkit so feed your senses um and spend some time playing with your child playing games right now is major and i've seen a lot of people doing that um i've also seen a lot of people um doing those like gift baskets and like dropping them off on people's doors. We have, um, we have a family in our neighborhood that has um, two seniors. So one at Miami University and one at my Miami Valley Christian. And I was like, I'm going to go drop them off some senior baskets, you know, that's, you know, and have it be anonymous, have it not be anonymous, whatever. It's still a really nice thing to do. And it also shows, um, also sets a really great example for your child. Um, giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, finding a place to retreat when you're stressed, um, lowering expectations and pra practicing radical self-acceptance. So radical self-acceptance, um, that's going to be something where you are, no matter what, I'm okay with who I am. And that's really hard um, for a lot of people. And so let's, you know, I think practicing that and trying to encourage yourself as much as you're encouraging your kids. I always tell kids, you know, when they start getting hard on themselves and talking negatively about themselves to me, I'm like, whoa, would your, I'm like, would your best friend say that to you ever? Um, and they usually say no. I hope always that they say no, but usually they say no. And, um, and I think that's a really kind of great way to put it. Like when you're thinking these negative thoughts in your head about how you're doing as a parent or, you know, the things that you've um, had to struggle with during this time, you know, say, would my best friend ever tell me that I'm doing a cruddy job as a mom because I had to put my kid in front of the TV for two hours while I was on a meeting. No, um, you know, accept where we're at. Limiting social media and COVID conversation. I shut off the news a long time ago um, because it was just giving me too much stress. And I follow like one person, um, Katie Couric, <laughs> who's, who has a, a post every day that kind of gives a good summary of what's going on. Um, noticing the good in the world, the helpers, helping others. Like I said, dropping off a gift basket, something like that can be really great finding something to control and control the heck out of it. Yes, control. 
how much you wash your hands, use moisturizer if you're washing them too much. Um, I've had that happen. Um, and getting creative and artsy. Um, you know, this is a really fun time to kind of bring back maybe some things that you used to do before you were a parent. Um, you know, what, before you had all, you know, sometimes we don't have all that much time still, but, um, you know, do things that are creative, do things that get your creative juices going. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> thank you, Kelsey. You're welcome. So I'm going to transition into later adolescence. So the focus here is on our high schoolers ages um, or grade levels like nine to nine to 12. So this is my primary uh, age group that I serve and have served for a number of years now. And so some of what I speak about is what I observe um, in their developmental state and also kind of what I've been seeing as I um, kind of work with a lot of my kids on my caseload. So I think it's possible to see a variety of responses from our older adolescents. So many of them could be really enjoying the downtime and can easily switch into that summer mode of living. Um, some of them may be missing the routine and structure of school. Uh, depending on personality types and possibly even issues related to mental health, um, some kids really thrive on a routine and come to really enjoy and appreciate it. And other kids could really go either way. Um, I find that a lot of kids who uh, perhaps may be coping with issues related to ADHD, um, they really thrive on the routine of school because they have a structure set in front of them to follow and they don't have to self-direct themselves. Um, and so um, they might find a way to kind of orient their days, but um, when it comes to working on distance learning and that kind of thing, those, that can be a challenge because they don't have a bell schedule to follow and they may not have that inner workings of themselves to be able to put themselves on a schedule. Uh, some of them may be anxious to see their friends. Uh, they may ex experience some restlessness. For our seniors especially, uh, they are coping with grief about missing their milestones and these transitional passages that they've worked through. Um, I was talking with a senior the other day and we were reflecting on this idea that um, they didn't know that their last day of school was going to be the last day of school and talking about how difficult that was because um, I think mentally, there's a lot of preparation that goes into, oh, this is my last day of high school. This is my last day of middle school. And when a lot of this began, uh, we were just thinking we were on a break. And some folks were talking about the fact that school could be out um, for the rest of the year, but there was nothing definite. And so a lot of seniors, I think, um, are really coping with that feeling of loss of, uh, you know, if I would have known that March, 12th or whatever was our last day of school, I would have approached that day a lot differently. Um, and along with missing prom and graduation and also all of the spring events that they missed. Um, and they might be angry about their own limitations. So the developmental tactic that these adolescents are trying to achieve, they have a strong need for independence and autonomy. Kelsey touched on this as she uh, talked a little bit about the developmental states for uh, kids in the lower grades. Uh, this is increasingly important for high school age students. Sadly, what does not support um, autonomy are executive orders from the government to tell everyone to stay home and not go anywhere. Um, those two things did not really go together. And so it can be really challenging. Kel there's a, uh, a slide that on Kelsey's that talked about the, the challenge is to support their independence and their agency in their life while they have to be kind of trapped at home with their families and their parents, which they're usually trying to um, kind of break free from or get away from. Um, not from a, like a bad point of view, but this is just a developmental task that kids in this age group are going through naturally. Uh, and then they're, so suddenly we are all kind of home together. Uh, they also have a tendency to believe that they are invincible. And so some of you that have uh, high schoolers in your home, you may have had some uh, ongoing and possibly challenging conversations about the seriousness of uh, some of what we're facing and um, the need for some of the guidelines that have been put in place. 
Uh, a lot of young people tend to believe this is not, I'm not going to get this. What's the big deal? Why do I need to abide by these things? Uh, and what we're finding is that this really takes a strong collective effort from the community to work together to keep things um, moving in the way that they need to. Um, but this is difficult uh, because teenagers tend to be so incredibly self-centered as part of their developmental state. Uh, they, and they have a hard time maybe wrapping their heads around the fact that um, that they, their actions may contribute to uh, part of the issue. Uh, part of that has to do with the fact that their brains are still developing, so they are still at times lacking in rational and sound decision making. And you might see them ping-ponging back and forth between some really sound, appropriate decision making and emotional reactions. And then you may see some times where they kind of hit the other way and they might have an outburst that's completely irrational. They may have a point of view that they're just really doubling down on. Um, and they may not have an appreciation for kind of the greater good of community. They, they're really focused on their world and their world, world only. Uh, I think this can vary from kid to kid and from family to family, um, but this, this is a, a, a thread that we may see uh, within this age group. So their sleep schedules are likely turned around. If they are in summer mode, uh, they might have gone into that kind of newborn phase where they are up late at night or most of the night and sleeping during the day. Um, they are used to connecting with their friends online. So the social challenges that a lot of the rest of us are facing, they may not be faced by that. They're used to FaceTiming their friends. They're used to staying in touch over social media. And so certainly seeing people face to face is really kind of the most desired form of social interaction, but they may have already found ways to keep in touch with folks because they were already doing that virtually before any of this happened. Seniors might be worried about their future. Um, this is particularly, particularly difficult because I find that for many of us, thinking ahead and planning ahead is kind of what pulls us through some really hard times. And for many kids in this particular age group, for seniors that are maybe headed off to college or university, the, part of their way of coping through the, the present day is this idea of, I'm going to be out of here. This is like, I'm gone. This, it's gonna, I'm going to start my life. It's going to be awesome. And to have that be held in a place of, of uncertainty can be really tough um, because their planning and their future orientedness um, is kind of hijacked at the moment, and that is the case for all of us. And so they might be stressed about, uh, is, my, is my school gonna be open? Um, what do I do if it's not? How can I um, get this education if everything is done online? Um, and so that might be some of what um, our seniors are facing in terms of what they're thinking ahead towards. Uh, and some of them may not have even considered that. And then there are some that may just be okay. Uh, I, as, as much as um, this presentation is sort of focused on um, children and what we will see in children in the midst of what's going on right now, I want to highlight my own experience as a clinician has, has had the, um, I've had the grace to observe children are much more resilient than we often give them credit for. And so for any kid in any age group, some kids may just be okay. And we don't necessarily need to be um, looking for areas of struggle. If they pop up, we wanna respond to them appropriately. But I'm finding there might be opportunities for kids to be handling this better than a lot of adults and that we can learn things from them um, because some of what their, their limitations in how they see the world are actually protective in a way. Uh, and they might just be fine. And uh, allowing space for them to be fine, I think is, is really an important thing too. Uh, and it, it's okay if they're okay, is really kind of the point that I wanted to make here. Uh, so within this age group, creating structure and routine, but allowing for change. So they may have naturally put themselves on their own sort of schedule, and it may be completely opposite than anybody else's in the house. But our brains thrive on predictability. We create these neural pathways within our brains and when they have been totally upended, we, we wanna find the path of least resistance and so finding a routine will put that in place. So what can we make predictable in our homes when everything else is kind of unpredictable? 
And so having meals at the same times, so having some certain rituals in the home, uh, some daily check-ins at some point, maybe it's an inside joke that you kind of have stumbled upon in the midst of all this. Um, it might, if it's not a daily ritual, maybe it's a weekly ritual. Uh, in our house, I have three boys under the age of eight. And so we have instituted um, date night where my husband and I sit at the table by ourselves Friday night. They are not allowed at the table and they sit in the living room and uh, eat their dinner with a movie. They think it's the best thing ever and we get a chance to actually have a conversation without 50 interruptions. And so we have made that kind of a Friday thing that we do uh, and, and we have all really enjoyed that. So are there things that you can put into place, whether on a daily or weekly basis within your home that create a sense of routine that we can kind of come to rely on? Find ways to spoil them and yourself. So uh, teenagers that love food, just like a lot of us. So making their favorite meal, uh, getting their favorite snack at the store, uh, spending time with them, maybe watching something funny together on Netflix or YouTube, sit next to them when they're in a decent mood and want, seem to want you around and just kind of get a feel for what's going on in the world. Maybe they can show you some funny things that they found on their phone recently uh, or talk to them about what's happening in the world. Um, so, um, we want to talk a little bit about when to take next steps. So, um, for the elementary age group that, uh, Mary was talking about, um, th these are symptoms of when, when we sh should maybe seek some additional help for, um, for a child in the family. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight these behaviors would would indicate a difference or a, a change in regular functioning so something that is new not something that was present prior to this crisis uh, it's it's lasting longer than it should so it's not necessarily like, like a pop-up type of thing it's going on for probably um, at least two weeks we would say um, clinically speaking um, and we, the, a lot of the things that we're doing maybe at home, different things that we've tried are not really working to abate these symptoms. So for the littler kids, it would be this intense and ongoing emotional upset. So they can't really regulate their emotions as well as they used to be able to. Um, for younger children too, we have depressive and anxious symptoms. So that can include thoughts of suicide or um, thoughts of self-harm or actual self-harm. Really strong behavioral changes, relationship problems, that would um, be some intensive conflict maybe with people that uh, they perhaps normally did not have as much conflict with. Uh, regression, Mary touched on that. So you might see, uh, especially within like maybe the uh, kindergarten, first, second grade, they would really regress and they would maybe uh, do a lot of baby talk, thumb sucking, um, cl really clingy, a lot of separation anxiety. Uh, and again, these things, these, these symptoms that if they're persisting and they're not really changing, you can't, you know, having these ha things happen every once in a while is okay, but if they persist, that is a concern. Uh, attention and academic difficulties, we may not see that in the summer as distance learning is on hold. Uh, an increase in nightmares, I will say regular nightmares. So once in a while nightmare is not a concern, but nightly nightmares um, would be a concern. Difficulty with sleeping and eating and eating and then physical symptoms or what we call somatic symptoms. So some ongoing unexplained, usually it's headaches and stomach aches. Um, younger children will carry a lot of their anxiety in their, in their gut, uh, have a lot of unexplained uh, belly aches and not really know, like that we just don't know where they haven't changed anything in their diet, nothing's really come about. Uh, and so these on, ongoing uh, changing in functioning that is, doesn't seem to go away is when we would want to think about um, seeking some additional help. Uh, for adolescents, it would be sleeping more or less than they should. Since I referenced them being on maybe a, perhaps a bit of that summer schedule, I, what I mean by this is you can't get them out of bed at all. They are they're in bed sleeping. Um, more, way more than they should be. Um, additionally, if they are having trouble sleeping, um, they just lay awake and, and that might be a component to their schedules getting flipped around. Um, but a, this would be a change in their sleep habits. So if, if, if a child has just gone into their normal summer mode where they're up till three, 
playing Xbox with their friends and then they sleep till noon, that's not, that might not be a change, um, but looking for a change in their sleep habits. A loss of interest in things that they used to enjoy doing. So if they were prone to connecting with friends over video games or having FaceTime chats with their friends, they used to do that when maybe uh, the stay at home order started, but now you've seen them kind of abandon that and they don't really feel like doing it anymore. That might be an indication that something else is going on. Withdrawing from others completely. So it's common for teenagers to withdraw from people in their homes, especially now when everybody is kind of stuck together. But if they have withdrawn completely from uh, key individuals in their lives, so their closest friends, um, perhaps other key adults that they're connected to, whether they're coaches or uh, youth group leaders or even teachers that they're connected to. If they've withdrawn from other people, that might be an indication that something is going on. Thoughts of self-harm or suicide, an overall sense of hopelessness or sadness, um, that's the ongoing sense that it's never going to get better. This is going to, this is going to go on forever and I, I can't even look forward to anything. I can't kind of come out of that way of thinking. Um, more than usual irritability. Some irritability is typical for this age group, um, but uh, having it go on, and I, I, one indicator here that I want to point out is, are they irritable with pretty much anyone they come in contact with, or is it relegated only to a few relationships? It's common for teenagers to be irritable with parent figures because they feel very safe with them. Uh, and, and they know that parents are acting as these kind of emotional containers for what the, whatever the child is going through. If they are irritable towards their soccer coach that they really like or their best friend's mom that you know that they're usually pretty, like, pretty cool with, um, that might be an indication that they're having a hard time. Or an increase in aggression. So if they're overly destructive and they're not usually... Um, destructive in that way. They can kind of process their anger or their frustration in other ways. Um, if they suddenly become uh, much more uh, aggressive in nature, either towards others or towards property, that can be uh, a sign. Apathy towards nearly everything. In my experience with teenagers who are coping with depression, apathy is the number one symptom that they will check off as I go through kind of their, their list. Um, apathy is that feeling of, I, I just don't care about anything. Like, who cares? Who cares about doing schoolwork? Uh, who cares about, you know, things that I used to enjoy? Who cares about sports? Who cares about friendships? Who, who cares? N none of it matters. Um, there's just really no point in it. Um, but so an ongoing sense of apathy um, towards, pretty much towards every category of life. You can't really get them motivated to do anything. And then a flat affect, which we describe clinically as sort of the experience of like, they're in the same type of mood, um, very little expression one way or the other. You don't see times where they um, are experiencing any sort of happiness or any sort of even irritability or any sadness. They're just kind of across the board flat all the time. So again, if we're thinking about uh, a change in previous functioning that persists for longer than it should and is resistant to typical forms of intervention. That is when we want to think about uh, seeking some extra steps and some extra help. Um, so we've had the chat going. Lisa, I, I think you've been keeping an eye on that. Um, are you able to kind of collate any questions from there or um, help us out with the chat? No. No specific questions that have come up. Um, so what I'll do is give everybody just a minute in case you have some questions you want to put in there. Um, and I'll just talk for a minute. Um, first, I want to thank our, our um, great presenters tonight from Children's, Rachel and Mary and Kelsey. Uh, we're very lucky that, uh, that we have them as a part of our Children's Hospital team uh, in Sycamore. Rachel, obviously from Indian Hill, but um, she oversees our program and has really helped us to establish and, and get it up and running so that our families have access to care. So um, first want to thank them. Um, want to thank all of you obviously for participating tonight. We hope that it was helpful. Um, in the chat and also uh, out on Twitter, I'll, I'll let you know which Twitter account to follow, but um, out on Twitter and in the chat, there's a link to a feedback form for tonight. Uh, we would really love your feedback. We know that we're heading into summer. Um, we know that there's a lot of unknowns, and if your feedback tonight suggests that this is helpful, 
um, and a format that um, that works for you and your family. Um, we may look to do some additional touch points uh, through the summer um, so that people have access to getting questions answered. Um, I also want to make sure that you're aware on our website uh, we have updated under our services section under the social and emotional wellness all of our contact information for our therapists as well as great information about summer care. So after seeing tonight's presentation, um, if you have additional questions that you'd like to take personally to one of our school based therapists. Um, the information is on the website for our um, each building has an assigned therapist, but in addition to that, there is summer treatment available. Um, and I can tell you, Kelsey that presented this evening and Nicole Snyder, who is over at the Green School, um, will be providing uh, the initial set of care for students. Laura Caponari up at the high school, I believe, is also planning to see some families um, yes. if she fills up or she has filled up enough, Rachel, correct, to see yes. students. Um, yeah. So lots of great opportunities, again, for school-based treatment services. Currently, Children's is working through telehealth, um, but uh, they can also connect you to other resources if you need it. Um, I'm seeing that a couple of you have tried to get into the survey and it's saying that you need permission. Um, I will go in there and adjust those settings to make sure that you can actually get into it. Um, every now and again, this thing gives me fits. It should be that anybody with the link can view it. Um, and can respond to it, but it doesn't always work for me. So let me get in there and see if I can change that. Um, and uh, I did see a, a quick question about um, any tips for elementary kids with ADHD over the summer, anything that would be really helpful for them specifically. I, I will answer a little bit and then okay. I'll, I'll see if Barry and Kelsey have anything to add. Um, one primary function that I see uh, in my experience with kids in ADHD, and this, I would say this is true across the age groups, even though I work primarily with older kids, is to be aware of, um, uh, of boredom as a trigger for, for bad behavior. Um, a lot of times kids with ADHD aren't necessarily able to acknowledge when they are feeling bored, and that is uh, a common place for them to start acting out. That is a challenge as a parent because you have to keep them going. Uh, and summertime doesn't always offer the opportunities to fill their days and fill their schedules, especially this year with um, camps and activities being canceled right and left. Um, but to help them de develop a little bit of a self-awareness about um, w when there may have been some challenging behaviors uh, to help them to identify, uh, is it possible that maybe this happened because you were just bored and you didn't have anything else to do? They are sensation seekers, uh, this, this uh, diagnostic category. They are looking for engagement. They're looking for social engagement. They're looking for entertainment of sorts. Um, they are prone to being more drawn to time on devices because they can get really sucked into that. That's okay within reason, um, but they can quickly um, use that as a, a too easy of a substitute for boredom and can get more sucked into that than, than other kids I have I found. Um, so helping them identify what are some of their go-to things that they can do, and maybe it's making a visual list of here are things that you can do when you are feeling restless and bored uh, and, and putting that somewhere that they can see. They need visual cues, visual reminders. They, they also really thrive on a daily schedule. And so if, if the days tend to look the same, even just giving them an idea of this is what we're doing today. They don't really do well with a lot of unpredictability, um, but having some predictable things within their days and some predictable times. And so that again, that might be meal times are at the same time, rest time is at the same time, game time is at the same time, outside is at the same time. Uh, they really thrive on that routine. Um, but I, I think uh, a, a trigger for kids in that diagnostic category, is, what I see often is, is the, the issue of boredom and not knowing how to meet that need for themselves. Um, Mary, I will unmute you in case you wanna add anything. Uh, thanks, Rachel. I, yeah, I really don't have a whole lot to add and you covered Pretty much what I was going to say is that um, implementing some sort of a structure for these kids over the summer, they really thrive 
um, on that structure and predictability. Um, I was going to suggest having a list of things to do, you know, go-tos when you're feeling bored. Um, and, you know, also to keep in mind that, um, you know, these, these kids are often um, a little bit uh, behind the curve on executive functioning. So um, just providing some additional support in terms of um, problem solving skills, conflict resolution skills. Um, but yeah, I think, um, and, and this summer is going to be more challenging than, than the typical summer for a kid that's diagnosed with ADHD, but um, just trying to keep as much of a structure as possible um, can be helpful. Awesome. We have just a couple of minutes left. If there's any other questions, we can try and hit those. It does not appear that we have any additional questions. Um, seeing a lot of great feedback though that everyone found this to be very helpful, some great tips and great information. So that's, that's great. That's our goal is to make sure that you have access to the information you need to help support your kids this summer. Um, as we are all struggling with the fact that we're not seeing them. So um, the website is rich with resources as our children's hospital therapists help me um, in the summer with new resources, new information that comes out that will be readily updated as well. Um, including our community resource guide, which is also out there. So um, we're updating that regularly, both with things that are great to help support your kids, um, but also things to help support your family. So uh, as you head into summer, if you have a need for um, childcare, should things change again in the initial stages of this, we had information out there about things like uh, childcare that was available for um, mandatory workers at the initial stages of the state home order, um, housing, information on there from the housing authority, information about how to access uh, food and additional resources through the summer if you need it, that will all be there. Um, so our goal is to make sure that you have sort of a one-stop shop through the website to get what you need to support yourself um, and your kiddos right now. So um, the link for this uh, presentation tonight when it's available and ready we will get that out. I will turn that over to Ms. Bonbright, who is our Chief Communications Officer. She'll figure out the best way to make sure you can find it. Um, but if you are Twitter folk, if you follow at SpeakUpAids, you will always be able to find up-to-date information, including this link. Um, it'll come through that Twitter feed as well. So with that, I'm going to thank our presenters again. Thank all of you for coming and wish you guys an excellent night and a wonderful summer. All right. Thank you. Thank you.